Thank you. I'm doing terrific. How are you doing? Great. Uh, now, Senator, in the list of inexplicable decisions, there is the Packers' decision not to go for it on fourth down in the NFC Championship game this year, and there's your decision to go to Cancun. We'll never get to the bottom of what happened in Green Bay, but what happened with the Cancun trip? Oh, look, it was dumb as hell. Uh, my my kids wanted to get out of there. We would had two days with no power, and so Heidi and I said yes, and, and we, we took them to the beach. And... and in hindsight, that was obviously a mistake, and, and ever since then, the media seems to be utterly fixated with it. So how have the people of Texas responded to it? Well, look, the people of Texas are focused on coming out of these storms, which we have now, and, and, and now repairing and rebuilding. And, and you look at the storms we had last week. Uh, we had two winter storms, one after the other hit Texas, and the combination of that caused the electrical grid to, to go down, caused essentially them to have to, to force a blackout for about 4 million Texans and cut off power, uh, many for several days. Uh, I think a lot of Texans are really pissed about that, that, that Texas, as the energy capital of the world, the idea that we couldn't keep our lights on, that we couldn't keep our power on is, is frustrating, it's infuriating. Uh, and I think where a lot of Texans are now is, is focused on making sure this doesn't happen again. Um, they're, they're also, you know, the number of Texans who had their, their pipes freeze and so had damage to their house. So they're in the process of, of repairing and rebuilding. But the broader question of what happens structurally to cause the power to go out is, is an important debate and one I'm very active in preventing this from occurring in the future. So, Senator, you said it's dumb as hell. I am curious about one thing. Did either of you say, Mrs. Cruz or Senator Cruz, to each other, this would look bad? Did either of you ever bring up the idea that, oh, gee, our constituents won't like this? Uh, look, it, it certainly occurred to me that, that it would look bad and people would, would criticize it. Um, at the same time, I'm a dad. I mean, our girls are 10 and 12. I'm on the road nonstop, and, and what happened, where it came from, is, is after two days with no power, uh, we found out school was canceled, and our daughter and one of her friends pitched to us and, and to the friend's parents, listen, what, why are we staying here? Why don't we go somewhere uh, where there's power and, it, and, and it's not freezing? And, and we were sitting there with school having been canceled, and we made the decision as parents. We were trying to be good parents, and we said, okay, sure. And, and we checked, and the prices were really cheap. And so we, so we you know, the plane flights, the plane was, was largely empty. And so we did it. At, at the time, I was trying to take care of my family, take care of my kids, which is what Texans were doing all across the state. And, and you know, here one of the challenges of public life is, is that you have responsibility in public life, but you still continue to be a husband and continue to be a dad, and, and you juggle them both. And, and often the kids end up on the losing end of that. Uh, the hardest part about being in the Senate is all of the time I spend away. I'm in Washington, D.C. today. Heidi and the kids are back in Texas. That happens a lot. And so when we had a, a window to, to, to take them, I – I made the decision to say, yes, let's do it. It was a mistake. And, and, you know, as I said, even when I got on the plane and was leaving, I, I, I started having second thoughts almost immediately. Uh, and so I ended up flying back the next day and, and getting on the, the, the first flight I could get on. The, the new rules are you have to take a COVID test before you come back. So I had to wait to take a COVID test the next morning, and then I got on the next flight after that. Well, Senator Cruz, I'm sympathetic because I've been double teamed by preteens myself. And there's frankly, it's, it's like a force of nature. And so I'm sympathetic, but I don't know that the Democrats will ever let you forget this. And I don't think you care. But I want to transition to a different argument. I want to use this to leverage you a little bit. I have been making the argument that Neera Tandon ought to be forgiven. I've been making that argument for a lot of reasons. A constitutional one, the OMB is close to the president. He ought to be given deference but also a very practical one, which is that uh, Twitter is a new world event. And if we as erect a Tandon standard that mean tweets about senators takes you out, we're going to wipe out thousands of uh, would-be confirmees under the age of 40, maybe tens of thousands, because social media is the Wild West and no one's developed that. 
any way that you can be persuaded to vote for Neera Tandon for the greater good. Well, you know, I will point out there is something a little different than just mean tweets in, in that uh, you, you're a constitutional scholar, Hugh. We have a confirmation process where the president appoints and the Senate confirms. I will tell you from the dawn of time, if you have someone that goes out of their way uh, to attack and insult a bunch of senators, whether on Twitter or before Twitter, if you wrote it on parchment, uh, I can promise you those senators who you've been attacking are not going to be all that eager to confirm you to a job. Um, that, that's just the reality of how the system works. And uh, I, I don't know Ms. Tandon, but, but she seems to have been unusually prolific in that she, she seemed to go out of her way uh, to try to piss everybody off. And so at this point, Joe Manchin, a Democrat, has said he's going to vote no. Mitt Romney said he's going to vote no. Susan Collins has said she's going to vote no. I'd, I'd say right now it looks like the, the, the nomination is, is in trouble and, and quite likely to go down. It would take a Ted Cruz who's under enormous public criticism right now for a boneheaded mood, to go to say, Joe Manchin, let's go out together and declare an amnesty for dumb tweets and, and dumb social media and say, from this point forward, people, be aware that we're senators and we're human too. And if you tweet stuff about us, we're going to remember when you want to be confirmed. But we're going to declare an amnesty because it would be good for the country. And I mean, right now you're getting piled on, and I think it's ridiculous. Uh, but it would be a good thing if we both sent up a flare that this stuff doesn't fly going forward, but also absolved. And look, I, I've got more near a tandem scars. I've used the line 20 times than the Zorro villains combined. Because I have been on green, I've been on sets with her too, as well as gotten the incoming from Twitter. But she's smart, she's capable, she could run OMB, and that's an extension, as you know, constitutionally, of the office of the president. He ought to get the most deference there and the least with the attorney general. But I really do think, Senator Manchin, you can't cut the limb off from underneath him. He has to be part of this, too. But isn't it about time that we all just kind of said, everybody calm down, ollie ollie in free, and we'll start over? Well, uh, you know, I'll say a couple of things. Number one... Uh, until the last couple of days, it looks like it looks like Joe Biden was on a path to be the first president since Ronald Reagan to get every single one of his cabinet members confirmed. And I got to say, that's pretty nuts. When we've got a 50-50 Senate, when the Democrats have the slimmest majority imaginable, that didn't make any sense. And so I've been making the case to the conference for some time. That, that I get that Republicans are, are unhappy about the result of last year's election, but, but we got to stand up and fight and, and, and find some backbone. Um, and, and at least so far, that hasn't happened. Now, look, there are other nominees that are more extreme. Javier Becerra has been nominated Amen. to be Secretary, Amen. Secretary of Health and Human Services. He is a left-wing activist. And HHS, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Javier Becerra is not a doctor. He has no scientific experience. He has no medical experience. He has no pharmaceutical experience. He has no experience with virology. He was, he's a lawyer. And, and, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, if you get sick, what do you do? You call a trial lawyer. I mean, and, he, and he, Senator he, Cruz may interrupt. Republican nominated. So, yeah. May I interrupt? He's a bad lawyer. He advocated yeah. for government enforced speech in women's crisis pregnancy centers, which was patently unconstitutional and struck down by the Supreme Court. So not only is he not a doctor, he's a lawyer. He's a bad lawyer. He is a pro-abortion zealot who has demonstrated that he will use his official powers to target his political enemy. And he's utterly unqualified for the job as a Republican nominated someone with zero medical experience, zero pharmaceutical experience to lead HHS in the middle of a global pandemic, that Republican would be last out of the room. Um, and at least right now, the Democrats seem hunky-dory with, well, let's put a trial lawyer there. What do you, you know, they, they talk about COVID, but they apparently are not remotely serious about putting leadership in place to actually fight the pandemic. So, so Senator Cruz, my argument would be that you go see Joe Manchin and say, Senator, I appreciate your being a judge of bipartisanship and partisanship. Why don't you join me in opposing Becerra and let's let Neera Tandon through because mean tweets is not a reason to turn down a nominee and utter incompetence and ideological extremism on a matter of divisiveness in the United States is, and isn't Joe Manchin allegedly pro-life? 
I don't think he claims that he is. I, if if he does, I don't know about it, but I don't think he says that he is. Well, he's just pro-free speech. And I mean, it, Becerra was Mr. Anti-Free Speech, but I would make that deal in a heartbeat, Senator. Uh, if, I, if I go back, because I am I know we're running out of time on the Tandon matter. I am, you know, Rick Grinnell got confirmed. He's a friend of mine, and I advocated. I, 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 I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what, you. If you can deliver Manchin's vote on Becerra, I, I'd be willing to vote for Tandon for that. Well, he doesn't talk to me. He talks to you, but you ought to go talk to him about that. Now, I, I want to go back to the $1.9 trillion while we have a chance. This is a nightmare, Bill. This is so yep. inflationary. Will Joe Manchin join you in scaling this back? Because it is, it's a disaster for the economy, and no less a person than Larry Silver has said so. Uh, uh, Larry, uh, former president of Harvard. Um, uh, I can't Let's think go. of it. Yeah, yeah. So, we, are we going to pare that down to a normal number? Uh, in anything resembling a world of sanity, the answer would be yes. Uh, unfortunately, we are in a world where the Democrats have control of both houses. Um, the chances of the House doing that, I think, are zero. Uh, I think Pelosi will crack the whip, and everyone will fall in line. In the Senate, we're fifty-fifty, and and so. This, like so many other things for the next two years, comes down to Joe Manchin. Listen, I've served with Joe for eight years. He, he's a very nice guy. He's affable. Everyone likes Joe. It's, it's hard not to like Joe. Um, his history in the Senate is that his rhetoric is quite moderate. And yet, in the time I've served in the Senate, I cannot think of a single time he has stood up to Chuck Schumer on any issue of consequence when it made a difference. In other words, the, the sort of joke among Republicans is that Manchin will sometimes vote with us when it's not the deciding vote. But at least if passed his prologue, he hasn't done so when it is the deciding vote. I hope that changes. I would love to see Joe press back on on Schumer and Pelosi and Biden, but the I don't know if Schumer has some screws or a medieval rack in his office, but but at least in, in the past, Democratic senators have been unwilling to cross Schumer and they enforce strict party discipline. The Republicans, look, I'm going to vote no on this monstrosity, but if they hold their 50 Democrats and Kamala Harris, they will get it through. And, and I'll point out they're also abusing the parliamentary rules and trying to ram through uh, entirely different provisions that have nothing to do with COVID. A whole lot of this bill has zero to do with COVID. This is all about paying off left-wing special interests. This is about paying off teachers' union bosses. This is about paying off their buddies in, in, in blue states that, that ha have dug themselves a debt hole. And, and one of the consequences, they're trying to push through a $15 minimum wage as part of this, which if that happens, the projections are 1.4 million Americans will lose their jobs. So the early legacy of the Biden administration, on day one, he destroyed 11,000 jobs with the Keystone Pipeline, destroyed 8,000 union jobs. And on month two, if they do this, they're going to destroy another 1.4 million jobs, predominantly low-income young people, especially African-Americans and Hispanics who tend to be in, in the jobs that are vulnerable to being destroyed by the policies they're pushing forward. All right, last question for you, Senator Cruz. I hope you're successful in that. Will you commit to me to talk to at least some Republicans and maybe the conference about what the Tandon rule will do, not in, in theory, but in reality to future nominees when the next Republican president comes along? Mitch McConnell's autobiography is called The Long Game. This is the worst example of not playing the long game I've seen in a long time because friends like Josh Holmes and friends in media who want to come in and are young, I'm not young, I'm 65, they're never going to get through if this rule goes into place. Like the nanny rule took out so many people for years. Will you talk to people about the long game here? Well, look, um, I got to say this. Apparent, apparently, uh, Nera Tandon has lots of friends throughout the legal world because you're the second person in 12 hours who's been leaning on me. The other was a, a Democrat who's a close friend who, who, who sent me a note last night. I, I don't know Miss Tandon. Um, she's not I, a friend I, of mine, Senator. I've, oh, I've only met her on Green Room and, and on Twitter. She's not a friend. I'm worried about other people down the line. 
you know, I, I will say this is not a new standard in that you can point back to, I can think of at least one example recently, which is my very good friend, Ken Cuccinelli, uh, who was put yes. forward to be Deputy Secretary uh, of Homeland Security. And Ken is a fantastic guy. He's a strong conservative. But Ken previously led the Senate Conservatives Fund, which, among other things, tried to primary Senate Republicans, went after Mitch McConnell directly, and the Senate wouldn't confirm him. He was a Republican nominee in a Republican Senate, and senators reacted exactly the same way, which is they said, we don't like people who have attacked us, and so we're not going to vote for them. And, and that, I would have loved to see Ken confirmed. He did a fantastic job. He was put in an acting capacity, but he didn't get confirmed because of his prior criticism of senators. And, and I'd be willing to bet if you went back to the Washington administration, you would find that that black there are others, senators but this is a Senator, bad way to get there. There are them. others. But this, this rule will take out thousands of people on social media. I just ask you consider it. You're a smart guy. Senator Cruz, great to talk to you. I got to talk to John Morlock. God bless you and good luck. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.